So first of all, again, welcome to the first time ever medical science E session, Science Advocacy in 2020. Uh, this is our first session this year as the medical science team. And again, uh, to mention, we're really excited about it. It will be really nice to see you face to face in the real assembly. But as you know, the COVID-19 process had affected our everything this year. And we are not having, we are not even a, uh, having an assembly this year. So hopefully we'll be seeing you as soon as possible. My hope is to see all of you in Istanbul, which is my home city, but we will see that. I hope that we'll get rid of this virus as soon as possible. So in the first part of this session, I want to talk about medical sciences 1920 term and what we did until now as the medical science team. As you might have known, I am the EMSA Medical Science Director for the term of 2019 and 20. And my name is Berkay Akad Ülker. And you can reach me from this mail, science at emsaeurope.eu. I ask for my emails as soon as possible. And if you have anything cool to share or any articles that you want to discuss or to just chit chat uh, from my personal mail, you can just reach me and then we can see the vacancies. So first of all, this year we started with gathering our team. So as you can see here, in medical science team, we have a research and internal assistant and a PR and external assistant. And you can reach them from their emails too. And I know that some participants do, re do reach them and uh, do share some cool stuff. Also, we have the medical science Google group right now, which also you can share anything you want there. And I added the uh, participants of this session too there. So you'll see really cool opportunities in the future in the Google group section. And also our second plan was to create an identity and culture of medical science with MedSci updates. And it was really useful for us because we literally had the opportunity to reach all of you with this very uh, unique idea. And the social media campaigns were really successful. In Instagram, we right now reach 600-ish uh, or 700 people for each story post. And also in Facebook, we reach from 1,600 to 2,200 people in every medical science update. So it is really a good option for people to see what we do. And also I want to explain that what we really do uh, in the background of this process. So first of all, the research and internal assistant looks for really cool articles from the magazines like and journals like Nature, Science and New England Journal of Medicine and she gathers the articles of the month. And then our curator, the PR and external assistant, curates the articles and prepares the medical science updates with the design and basically that is the part that we actually cook the updates. And then uh, I look at the updates, I check the uh, grammar mistakes if there are any, I check the articles if they're appro appropriate to uh, share. And then with the collaboration with our public relations officer, we share it through LinkedIn, Twitter, and also Instagram and Facebook, which is the uh, social, media, social media platforms that you can see these updates. And also you can comment to these updates if you like to from the personal email. The World Antibiotic Awareness Week, uh, right now, this really seems to be too long ago. It was in November 2019. And the aim of this project was basically to let you inside the AMR, which is the uh, main work, main work area of medical science pillars since 2017. And we also have a policy about that. Right now, we have the joint press release, uh, which is called the anti antimicrobial resistance and this joint press release was made was made with ETSA, EFSA and the uh, and also EPSA. It was inside the European Antibiotic Awareness Day and also we reached too many people with this joint press release and after that we had a small campaign which you can also apply in social media and our members as you can see here applied in social media and they had their so let me have my pen there, just wait for a minute. As you can see here, we had our social media campaign. This is EMSA Samsung, and this is the social media campaign of EMSA Berlin. And 
we had really good amount of people and a good amount of FMOs attending to this campaign. We had 30 or 40 ish FMOs. And after that, we had a WHO report, which we reported the social media campaigns and also the field events of the FMOs to the WHO and we submitted them and they added them to their uh, event map for the specifically prepared for the World Antibiotic Awareness Week. And then one of our latest projects is the Medical Science 101 booklet. So this booklet is very unique and also it's very cool to have for our pillar because as you, as you know, and if you want to work for medical science in the future, actually we don't have so much information about medical science. But right now we're preparing this booklet under four sections and the four sections will be the FMO developments, uh, very creative activities for the FMOs to prepare the medical science events and what is medical science and the definition of medical science. So if you want to be included in medical science and MSA, what you should do and what are the places that you can be a part of medical science. And then uh, we have the research guideline, which will be again, really cool for you to have your future MSA projects with a guideline and that you can uh, use for guidance. And then we also have the philosophy of medical science and the scientific approach itself, where you can learn and educate yourself about the uh, scientific philosophy and the methods of science. And actually it's really easy to read, but we are now preparing it. So that is the thing that we'll be preparing hopefully in September and publishing. And also we had a very cool survey with our external partner, Young Investigators Network. Uh, this network was founded by, our, my, by my predecessor, the medical science director of 2015 and 16, Benedict Pelza. And with this Young Investigators Network, we attended as the medical science team and we had two more people from EMSA to be included in this as the student task force. And we had a survey on attitudes of medical students towards the COVID-19 pandemic. To this survey, we had 1,335 medical students applied and from various countries, which is like 40 countries, I think. And right now we submitted our articles to five or six journals and we're waiting for our response to, uh, for it to be published in the future. And again, we had our EMSA press release on COVID-19 on March the 3rd, and which is again really cool for us because we were one of the first student associations to be uh, advocating science uh, for COVID-19, even it was uh, not declared as a pandemic by the WHO. And as you can see here, you can go to the website of EMSA and under the COVID-19 section, you can read the whole press release. We had another statement in the COVID-19 situation. It was for the uh, spread of misinformation. As you know, uh, there has been many misinformation and also many conspiracy theories during the COVID-19 uh, months, I can say. And we basically shared with our members and also our stakeholders the uh, information points that they can reach and also that they can uh, look after and also that they can have the true info. Out of it. Also, you can read this uh, statement from the COVID-19 section uh, in our website. So, coming to the actual part of this session, what is science advocacy? Actually, it's kind of a new term. It's been used as a term for like uh, 10 years mostly, but it was also existing uh, before that. So, basically, when one thinks of advocacy, the first idea that comes to mind is generously compensated lobbyists walking the halls of legislature and advocating on behalf of their clients, like in the famous TV series Love and Order. But actually, uh, it's not like that. While this image made for great television drama like this, uh, it is an incomplete picture, especially as regards the science advocacy itself. So according to Merriam-Webster dictionary, an advocate is a person who works for a cause or group. So this definition actually appropriately describes the science advocate itself. According to surveys, the majority of science students desire to engage with the public and to inspire students and teachers alike about the wonders and power of science and technology. But others want to bring their stories to government in the hope of inspiring support for the next generation of researchers 
And actually, this part is the part that we want you to uh, get included. So, the relationship between science policy and advocacy is also important. Uh, science can be a powerful tool for developing policies about public health, such as vaccine hesitancy, and also which is a thing that we've been working with the public health pillar. And at the same time, policies can have a powerful impact on the conduct of science. An essential component of policy-related science advocacy is explaining science and the scientific process. And one dimension of science advocacy is how active a particular scientific policy is promoted. And actually, there is a communication gap between scientists and politicians, and scientists have to learn and explain the importance of their own work. And that is why it is really essential to have a policy-related science advocacy. Too few policymakers understand the terminology of science, so it's imperative to analyze audiences' scientific literacy. If scientists want to advocate for science, they need to add some additional skills to an already exceptional skill set. Being outstanding in one's field does not make one an engaging communicator. Learning how to communicate science to an audience is, an, is as much important as science itself. So as you can see here, if you want to tell people science, you don't need to be really furious about it. You don't need to uh, treat people like that. If they don't know anything about science. You should be more calm and you should be much more knowing about your audience's knowledge level to advocate science. So policy and advocacy can take as much time as you're willing to give it, and actually it takes a lot. A lot of scientific societies have outreach positions like AMSA, which is a great, great place to get started. Scientific professionals and associations can play important value-adding roles in policy-related science advocacy by facilitating constructive interactions between scientists and policymakers. But they must be careful to protect their credibility and integrity by basing our activities within our scientific expertise. So why this is important? Right now, as you can see in the COVID-19 situation, the governments don't know too much about the science because it is not their uh, knowledge that they should know of. They should know economics, they should know politics, and they should know how to rule a country. But when it comes to science, they should just go to the expertise and to expert people and ask their opinion when it comes to some scientific matters like COVID-19. Right now, some, some countries have their guiding, guidance professors and they ask professors to how to act and how to define their policies during the uh, COVID-19 situation and the pandemic. And actually for some countries, it really works. And there are the really good uh, examples of that. But also there are some bad examples of really bad scientific policies, as you can see. And I don't see the need of mentioning their names here. So the part of us here to advocate science with press releases and joint statements, and also really basic statements from EMSA, which can be like uh, 400 or 500 words. And with them, we are advocating science and telling people the importance of research and the importance of actually freedom of scientific thinking and knowing the true information. So to finish my part, I can say that scientists who know how to talk to Congress are worth their weight in gold. So if you know how to talk in front of people, if you know how to advocate your ideas, and if you know how to be a literate of science, then you'll be able to really affect too much people's life. And also, you'll, if you be really experienced in policies, then again, you'll be really successful in politics either when it comes to science. And lots of countries really lack this right now. So our job as AMSA is right now to advocate science inside the European Union and also the European Council. But right now, we have these science policies all over the world. So I hope that you'll be uh, having some inspiration from this session in the future presentations. But now we'll be playing a small game before we continue. So this is my references, as you can see here. So uh, I'll wait for 10 seconds or something so that you can uh, check them out with your camera. And 
I hope that you like this part of the presentations and session. And thank you for listening to me. Um, all right, then um, I'm going to start with my part, with, which is the history of science advocacy. So um, you got a sort of a glimpse into what I'm going to be talking about <laughs> just one second ago in the code game. But um, yeah, I'm just going to give you a short overview of kind of how um, science advocacy came to be, um, how it developed, and kind of how it um, has changed over time. All right, um, just so you know, I'm taking my um, content mostly from this article, which is very interesting. So I'll have the link for that, um, a QR code for that afterwards, so that you can read it in full length in case you're interested. All right. Okay, so um, in general, um, I'm going to give you a short history on how science advocacy um, has developed over time. So as you saw in the code game, um, science used to be perceived as a very elitist concept, or it wasn't a very elitist concept, because it was based off of um, the promotion of people in power, people with money. So those were the only people who could kind of afford uh, to indulge in science and not kind of have to work, you know, working class obviously had other things to think about than science at the time. And it was only in the 18th century when this paradigm really started to shift um, because uh, science was no longer kind of perceived in that way that it was on something exclusive to the uh, powerful or rich people. And it really kind of um, shifted the perception of science really kind of shifted um, in the sense that people uh, promoted freedom of thought and scientists were no longer prosecuted for, um, you know, their ideas, which were very rational rather than um, clerical. So the next shift um, came kind of towards the 20th century. And the reason why there was a shift in this, the perception of science at this time was that there were um, very impactful events in history, as we all know, with two world wars and um, lots of changes in the political climate in the world. Um, there was very much of a kind of going away from the uh, sense that science is purely scientific, purely objective, but actually people started to see it um, as a tool that they could use to apply in policy, in politics actually, and in the general um, societal realm, really. So I have a little quote here for you. Policymakers did not want the progress of science to no longer be left to chance. So this is really what kind of sparked the want to, um, to, to use science in a different sense than it had already been used as. As I said, prior to um, these political changes in the 20th century, Science was really a very, um, you know, scientific <laughs> in that sense um, thing that it was very objective and it was purely about what you were researching, what you were studying. But um, after the 20th century, it was this attitude, which you can see on the screen right here. They didn't want science to be left to chance anymore and they wanted to kind of use politics, use policy to change this. So these are some important developments that really shifted this um, revolution of the 20th century. So science has been kind of linked to industry and war, obviously, in the sense that these are um, impactful events that cause a change in the way that we, do, that we perceive science and that we use science. Um, science has obviously been pop, uh, politicized and secularized, so removed from any supernatural concepts, removed from sort of the, um, the bigger uh, picture and really rationalized more. Um, it's also been used and is further and further being used as an international tool of power. Knowledge is power. This is a really old attitude but it's uh, ever so true nowadays and it keeps continuing to um, stay kind of true in the way that we use it at the time. Other things um, that have impacted this perception are that our knowledge systems are open nowadays. So we have open access, we have 
large access to books, to internet, to all these things, which um, just really changed the way that science can be done at this day and age. Um, also, there's a certain sense of predictability that um, has kind of ar arisen in the recent years. And also, um, science has been kind of expanded into civil society in the sense that it has really become a concept that is um, accessible nowadays to anyone, really. So what we're going to do next after this short um, overview is we're going to have a little group work um, session right now. So what we have is we have two cases of, um, a, of two different scenarios where um, science was taken from a very scientific research-based approach to suddenly being thrown into the context of advocacy and um, policy and media and all the aspects that entail um, science advocacy, which is what we're talking about today. So for that, we're going to split you into breakout rooms. And then we're going to have two different kind of subgroups. So even numbered groups will um, be talk, will be discussing uh, one of the articles and well, one of the cases and uneven numbers will be discussing the other case. Um, and after you have read and kind of discussed this, um, we'll be coming back and you will uh, join um, together again and present your case to the other group. Um, we're going to be jumping in and kind of moderating these um, breakout room sessions. So in case you have any questions, which there might be, because these, you know, are <laughs> uh, interesting cases, but they're also kind of, you know, at first glance, maybe they're not as clear. But um, we're going to try and moderate them and uh, give you useful advice while we pop into your sessions. Okay, great. So um, I hope you all had time to read the article. It's not bad at all. If you didn't finish it or if you only skimmed over, that's completely fine. Um, and I hope you had some time to discuss um, because I would like to ask you to present the cases to your counterparts. So um, you can just give like a brief overview about what the case was about um kind of what you learned from it what you see um what kind of aspects of science advocacy uh you can get from this case so is there anybody from uh groups um two and four so the uh even numbers who can who wants to say something about the case study number one I don't mind summarizing it. Perfect. All right. So case number one is follows a doctor and his pursuit of clarifying the benefits and the problems with GMO. However, there's a problem with his claim is he does not have scientific research to support his claims. Uh, he, in the beginning of the paragraph, he said, He's an academic scientist. He has been never exposed to this. This being actually the Guardian newspaper interviewing him and asking him what is his view on well, GMO or genetic mod genetically modified organisms using this specific case of, sorry, I'm still trying, uh, GM potatoes uh, with lactin transferred from the snowdrop and uh, non-GMO GM potatoes. The problem with this research is he has not done any prior, well, prior research, not even meta research, not even his own research. And he was faced with a lot of controversy, especially from his boss, uh, Professor Philip James, who uh, actually fired him and said his conducts are unscientific. Uh, during his well, well, media exposure, some of his colleagues also called out some of his problems in his methodology or his way of approaching science. And he replied in ad hoc attacks saying, 
your scientific research is not un un is unscientific. The problem really arises when, when you lay your eyes on his personal gains, uh, specifically on page three of the document, where he was awarded a German NGO prize, a peace prize for agreeing with their agenda, whatever, even though the doctor, Dr. Puss, I'm so sorry you mispronounced his name, I just call him Dr. P, has been urging for years to get a credible GM testing protocol uh, to be established and be acceptable to the majority of scientists, at least they have a base to build from. But 10 years later, there is still no protocol in place. And in the very last paragraph, uh, the article addresses how the European Union does not have a generalized, well, protocol on testing GMO food. And food is something that is so vital to us. It, I mean, in the States, you have FDA, which you have the entire agency governing what you should eat and what you shouldn't. But in the EU, how they pursue in regulating it is not by a protocol, rather by nations' own individual ways. And this really underlines a huge problem in scientific research is when new evidence is presented and when there is conflict of interest within industries and et cetera, what is the correct way to approach? Whether government intervention as uh, it might be a good start, but then you will be also uh, involved with uh, parties and bureaucracy or by purely uh, neoclassical Economic, excuse me, economical, economical you know, supply and demand curves. Uh, this really brings me to a uh, case that I remember that happened a long time ago, which was uh, the general doctor, the general surgeon of United States used to promote smoking cigarettes, and they will actually put ads like "You should smoke cigarettes." The general surgeon said so. So you, you should do it, it's good for you. And then when new evidence is well, presented, it took an extremely long period of time for any changes to happen. Am I going overboard? Uh, is it too long? <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> and that really, well, concerns me in what I said earlier in my uh, breakout group was, uh, I personally believe uh, science in, is a way of knowing, which is the better you remove the human part of science, the better you can get more, the better results you can get. And in the world of, well, I wouldn't say corporate greed, but like normal market stuff and uh, existence of firms, it is very, very difficult for us to separate, well, science and marketing. And for the average Joe like me, with no expertise in certain fields and certain niches, how is it possible for me to know what is right and what is wrong? Even the doctor himself doesn't know what's right and what's wrong. How do you expect consumers to believe what's right and what's wrong? So I believe that summarizes case study one, or roughly. Thank you very, very much. <laughs> that was very insightful. Thank you for those interesting thoughts, definitely. Um, and thank you for participating like this. It's very nice to see that somebody um, really gave this article some thought. That's really great. Um, okay, so then is there somebody who wants to do the same for article two? We're not the same. You can just quickly summarize your thoughts. Um, tell us what you thought of the case study. So this would be groups uh, one and three. Is there anyone? If you just want to kind of give us like a quick summary of what you, what you read, what you discussed. Is there anybody? 
otherwise we can choose people <laughs> at random. Obviously we're not gonna force you to talk, but it would be really great for the session to kind of um, have you participate. And we would be very happy to have you participate. So if somebody from these sessions, uh, from these, sorry, groups wants to say something. Yeah, uh, I can go. Perfect. Okay, so the case study, uh, case study two was about uh, the case study of the person named Seralini. Uh, so Seralini, uh, his research was uh, on this GM crops. Uh, this uh, specifically the here told the genetically modified maize and uh, his uh, article was named Food and Chemicals uh, Toxicology, which was published in November 2012. Uh, so his research was uh, the effect of GM crops on the health. So uh, he actually uh, found out that the GM crops ha had a bad a negative effect on our lives by testing them on rats and the rats had problems with the health like kidney problems, uh, organ dysfunction and tumors. So he uh, rounded off with the, his uh, research and publicized it and he, there was a lot of criticism uh, on his research uh, from the public and the politics and he, uh, the, uh, there was a video re uh, re entire, uh, like video re uh, released by Seralini and his team uh, on his research in, which was uh, in for, for, to which he entitled are we all guinea pigs like uh, I, what I understood is uh, he said that uh, the GM crops, genetical modifications are happening in our society uh, without double checking. Uh, is it okay? Is it uh, good for us? And it's like the genetically modified maize is something which is uh, getting popular. It was getting popularized. So it, he was, uh, he was uh, I think he was mentioning, uh, they made humans the guinea pigs for their tests. So uh, after his uh, research, like uh, while his research, uh, the person named Uz Uztai, uh, he was also uh, into the study of this, uh, like when the Royal Society set up working uh, group, groups and uh, with EF SARS and uh, it was also on uh, food chemical toxicologies and he also found out this uh, almost same uh, thing happening with the test subjects uh, tumors kidney organ failures uh, he was all he his work was also published publicized and after his work has publicized um, countries like Russia, Kenya has uh, stopped taking the stop stop accepting uh, genetically modified crops and GMOs. Uh, they announced that GMOs are bad for health, uh, bad for us. Uh, as uh, as the views of this uh, Mr. Oh, sorry, Dr. Pujtai was, uh, he, he was uh, more, to, more of a strictly science-based person, unlike, uh, oh my God, I'm sorry, Seralini, uh, unlike Seralini, who uh, was a bit more, uh, he, uh, he had a bit more ideology uh, with him uh, to him and uh, 
those were the main things which is discussed in the thank you okay thank you for summarizing i'm sorry to cut you off but we have to um carry on with the session because there's some more interesting parts coming up but thank you very much you two for participating and for sharing your thoughts so i hope you um were all able to take something away from these case studies um yeah maybe just some like practical examples of science advocacy all right so to wrap up my session part here um is uh to kind of give you like an overview of where this where all this has taken us where all the science advocacy has taken us current state of affairs so obviously we figured out science is a political issue not only a scientific one it has an impact on socioeconomic and institutional structures in our society um, there is business kind of science advocacy and also corporate science advocacy which are kind of two different like ways that science advocacy can be practiced um, and during all this we really see that there is a need for transparency in science um, because uh, do we really have a democratic process in science advocacy that is the question which leads me to where we're heading so like a short outlook into uh, our future and the future of science advocacy so um undoubtedly this is a growing field as it has you know as history has shown this is something that is becoming increasingly important in our society um, it can be related to other fields such as evidence-based medicine etc which are kind of all heading in the same direction of really transparent science uh, which can be accessible to all people in society um, this uh, raises the question will it be included in our medical education will we be taught more science advocacy um, because one thing is clear is that we need new ways of communicating science and there are new ways of communicating science um, and these are all evolving as we do as um, a profession as well um, which uh, brings me to my last point is that we are the future of science advocacy and uh, my next presenter colleagues will be talking more about this topic to you so on that note thank you for your attention um, if you have any questions um, you can reach out to me on my emails my Amazon email or my regular email um, yeah so uh, thank you for listening to my part. And if you scan this QR code, um, you can see the article that I referenced during my uh, little section here. Um, yes. So then I'll pass it on to Lara. Right, hello everyone. Um, my name is Lara. I'm a medical student in Turkey and I'm also the one of the health policy assistants in EMSA. And I will try to tell you about some arguments on why we actually do need science advocacy. Let's get started. The first one is like Stella said, um, science is never alone. Science is not just a set of facts like set free in this world. It is related to many, many fields, um, including politics and legislation and policies that are being put into practice. Um, and so in today's world, uh, I think it is not enough to just be a scientist and you need an exceptional set of additional skills to translate your ideas into the general public and um, for people to understand. We need to know um, the relationship between legislation, the policies made, and the evidence-based science that we are working on. Um, so, Ms. Carney is from the AAS, which we talked about at the beginning of the presentation, and Sude will talk even more about it. Um, it this organization, it gives um, workshops for science advocacy and works on the representation of science. Well, let's move on. Um, we need responsible advocacy. So science is a powerful tool. 
and it can be swayed um, in many ways, but um, it feeds off of um, the ideas that it is interlinked with. So this is actually still an ongoing debate. Like Stella said, science advocacy is an ever evolving field and we need more research done on the science and policy interface. So at this point, um, I would like to ask you um, a question. Does advocacy harm our credibility as scientists? Before I kind of um, shortly explain the arguments on both sides of the question. Um, if you would kindly scan this QR code on the screen and share your opinion with us. And I will just go to the website and display the votes. So, um, but there are many arguments made in, you know, yes, it does uh, harm our credibility as scientists. And there was, okay, for the people who say that no, uh, our credibility is not harmed um, by advocate, advocating for our science, um, there was a poll, general survey conducted by George Mason University, and they found, uh, they interviewed some people about some statements made by climate change scientists. And as you might know, like climate change is quite a controversial topic um, in science. Um, in, and it has diffused into politics quite heavily as well. So um, this survey, the general consensus was that uh, no, um, it does not harm our credibility as scientists. And some of these statements made by the scientists included their own opinion and sometimes their own opinion that said our uh, evidence-based science should be incorporated into policy decisions. So these people voted that it didn't um, change how they respected these people as scientists. But on the other side of the spectrum, there are some researchers saying that when professionals decide to use the power of their expert knowledge um, to control policy outcomes, the public image of their professionalism changes. And they say, um, you know, when science is mixed with public policy, it is easy to ignore it. Um, because now um, the science is like perceivably shaded by interpretation and its accountability seems to disappear to some people. Um, this is one side of the discussion. And I'm gonna read a sentence because I think it's very compelling. The paradox lies in the fact that the political power of professionals can be retained only if it is not exercised. So that's like you acknowledge that scientists have political power, but you that loses its accountability when it's actually exercised. So that's quite interesting to dis discuss. Um, yes, I think that's what I want to say about that here. And that brings us on to our next argument, which is that we need communication. Um, many problems, including the pandemic that every country virtually is struggling with right now. Um, and it seems like we are all relying on a vaccine to get us out of this situation. So um, it's ironic in some places, um, but the truth is like science feeds off of every area that it gathers its inspiration from in the first place. Um, we need um, good communication to ensure that we are enabling the true representation of science. And like, like I'm saying here, we need more skills to translate our science. And like Stella said, it, science used to be an elitist concept and it, it, it sometimes still is. Um, people don't try to explain what they have discovered, but it has a place in policy making. So we have a 
bilateral connection here. Um, and there is a researcher, Amanda Detmer, at the Yale University Child Study Center. Um, she has become involved in education policy, and I'm going to read a quote from her. Uh, the methodology and theory of education research, as well as my newfound knowledge of education policymaking, now shapes some of my new scientific inquiries. So this supports um, the other argument, which said that science feeds other fields and other fields feed science as well. But some, um, much of the unease with um, researchers exercising advocacy has to do with a lack in transparency, which is um, unfortunately common. Um, and it, it actually has a very simple solution, which is that scientists have to be completely transparent with their work. And we need, for that, we need to be able to trust scientists with that. But um, that's, you know, there's still mistrust in scientists, so I don't know uh, what you would think of that, but, and then um, advocacy doesn't have to be blurry. So what does that mean? Um, it, it is related to translating our science. Um, advocating for our science means that researchers have the duty to explain their data and point policymakers to the best available evidence. And there's another quote here, which says, philosophers have made the argument in favor of scientists engaging in advocacy as a public service. So that's um, providing the general public with the valuable knowledge that you have recovered uh, with your experiments. Um, Scientists hold specialized expertise and they should not just worry about their credibility. That's the opinion. And this is also related to the previous point, which is that there are different ways of advocacy. So um, protesting like this here is not the only way of doing science uh, advocacy. If you think that it, you know, we asked in Kahoot, your individual advocacy also makes a difference. Um, it's an intricate process and it should be objective, not self-serving. Um, some researchers say that they, they feel that their job is to provide policy neutral science relevant to the policy question in a way that people could trust. And obviously policy feeds off of many, many other areas like economics, um, arts, maybe education, then other than science. So when science is supporting politics, it should be from a objective perspective. And of course, there is still a lot of work to define these boundaries and define the best way to engage in stuff like this. But like Stella said, again, I'm quoting Stella all the time, um, we are the future of science advocacy, so we can do the work. And then this is my last point, which is extremely relevant, I'd say, in this time um, where we are trying to tackle COVID-19, we saw a huge rise in misinformation as well as open access to scientific journals and preprints and peer-reviewed articles. So, and that's because, um, like it says here, now that now more than ever, we need to strengthen and build international, intercontinental, and national scientific cooperation between scientists. When the virus says genome was sequenced days later it was shared with scientists all over the globe and that's one of the biggest reasons why we are moving so fast um, because there's open access to scientific knowledge and know-how and data sharing and we have all this technology that enables us to do that um, and 
of course, you know, um, there is a surge in misinformation as well. And science advocacy and communication of science is needed desperately at this time. All right, that brings me to my to the end of my presentation. These are my resources and references. You can find the um, poster presentation of the survey that I was talking about. It's actually um, a lot more detailed than I uh, presented. So thank you for your attention. I will now um, give the floor to Sude. Okay. Hi, guys. Um, I'm Sude Chaldorolu, and I'm this year's uh, PR and external assistant in MSA Europe. And my topic is going to be how can we be a part of science advocacy? And I'm going to be talking specifically about how to include ourselves into this great opportunity. So um, this is made by me. I just came up with three major topics that we can discuss. And I'm going to be talking about each of them specifically, which are organizations, um, EMSA, and individually. So first, at EMSA, uh, we advocate um, not only science, uh, but ethics and health in different pillars. And no matter the pillar, uh, we always try to inform the inform and spread the information. And um, as a medical science team of this year, we work on how to advocate uh, science. I, for one, am an advocate of science because uh, each month we curate uh, medical science updates and uh, we curate the articles from respected and well-known journals. And every time we um, advocate science because we go by evidence-based information and we choose trustworthy information. And also you can advocate science on your own. First, uh, what you can do is that you can learn how to be an advocate like you are doing right now. And then you can teach it to others to inspire them like we are currently. So um, also you can say, you can promote campaigns, you can create campaigns, and you can join the campaigns by yourself. For instance, when we're talking about uh, creating a campaign, what you can do is that you can talk to your um, university and you can make them prepare a session or you can uh, do it by yourself and try to educate your um, classmates, your, you know, the people from other universities. And also you can attend some online sessions like you are currently. And then I'm going to be talking about organizations and societies. First, um, we have a Society for Neuroscience. Um, even though they, are, uh, they focus mainly on neuroscience, um, they are a really great advocate. What I loved about the, the society is uh, that they provide advocacy training seminars, uh, which is uh, like four times, five times a year, which you can attend online. So this is a really great opportunity that I, sh I think that you should uh, benefit from. And also uh, what they uh, focus on is that they uh, have an application that where you can get up-to-date information. And this is the second one, um, Sense About Science. And um, this is an organization that fight, uh, fights against uh, misinformation and it's uh, based in United Kingdom. And I'm gonna be talking about two different campaigns. One is Ask for Evidence campaign. And that is a campaign that um, helps people request uh, for themselves the evidence, um, the evidence behind new stories, uh, new claims, new policies, um, which I believe really sufficient. Uh, in public ways, and all trail campaigns are uh, calls for the past and present uh, clinical trials, trials to be registered for their uh, summaries and full methodology. This is uh, this campaign is about like an open access campaign, and then we have American Association for the Advancement of Science, which everyone has been talking about today, and. 
This is important because uh, it supports evidence-based science. And they claim that in order to be an advocate, you have to understand the science education and you have to know the science education. And also uh, for them to be heard publicly, they say that the public en engagement is uh, crucial. Um, so the spreader, the better, basically. And um, I want to thank you all for your attention. And um, I personally want to thank you all for, uh, you know, uh, attending till this um, late hour with us. So thank you. And um, I'm going to uh, let Barkai talk for now. So I really want to thank everyone attended to this session. And I hope that this session was really good and effective to all of you. Uh, right now, I will share the uh, feedback form with you. And there you go. From this QR code, you uh, should be able to see it. Please uh, go to the form and fill it down. It's really important for us to see your feedbacks because this is our first e-session as the medical science team. So with the inside the next sessions and also uh, in the ultimate assembly sessions, we'll be really uh, looking at these uh, feedback and do appropriate stuff in the future sessions but i hope that you like this one and i hope that you had some take-home messages great so uh, to wrap it up again uh, as we started from the beginning and as the things i said please uh, try to advocate science as much as you can in as especially in these days it's really important to advocate science because as we see Politicians and also the policymakers don't really care about science at the moment. And that's why we are having these hard days in COVID-19. If you care about science and if you care about the scientific data, then it would be much more easier for you to uh, build your life, build your policy and build your strategies against coronavirus, but not especially coronavirus in any is issue that you should be caring about. Most importantly, the climate change. For example, since 2017, people are literally trying to advocate science and there's been huge protests about science advocacy, but right now we are still uh, having a lot of things to do in the future. So for us, uh, that is the end of the session. I want to thank to my medical science e-session team present here, Lara, Stella and Sude. They had a really good job during the uh, process and also in the preparation. They had really hard work to do. And I hope that you liked. It's right now 10 p.m. in Turkey. And maybe in your countries, it's even more different and later or earlier. But I'm really grateful that you came here and listened to us until now. So see you. Bye. -bye.